This is my convention. What is happening to it? Defending against the modern day downgrade as we head downhill at breakneck speed. Speaking truth, exposing the lies. This is Polemics Reports. You know why you do it. You don't do it because you get paid well. You don't do it because men love you. You do it because you love men and because more than that, you want to honor God. From a location somewhere in the eastern Montana prairie, this is your host, J.D. Hall. Hello, and you're listening to Polemics Report, and this is your host, J.D. Hall. The introduction was not lying. Thank you so much for listening in. This is a program we hope will be glorifying to God, convicting the sinners, and edifying to the saints. We've been doing this since 2014. My chair squeaks. Get used to it. I should probably bring a new chair. But uh, our goal is to teach you and to train you in your powers of discernment so that you might be skilled in the word of righteousness. We get that from the Bible, actually, Hebrews chapter 5. Now, here's the thing. Discerning people in the church are often treated like the redheaded stepchildren of the church, disrespectfully like we hate people. Let me clarify. We don't hate people. I don't hate anyone. God hates some people. I mean, I'm a Calvinist. I believe that. I don't hate anyone. Um, We love people, and we love the church. So what you're going to hear tonight is some criticism towards people who claim to be Christians, and that's exactly who the Bible tells us to criticize, those who claim to be Christians. And so I don't think we'll be talking about Kanye or Kim tonight. I think we might be talking about some other evangelical leaders and stupid things that Christians are doing and some people who claim to be Christians but are really not. And that's the bad news that we'll get to in just a few moments. Let me warn you first, though, the reason we do this is to help train and equip the local church. Some, we've discussed this before, local pastors hate polemics report and pulpit and pen and protestia because their church members read it and they learn maybe the origins of this worship song that don't glorify God, just to give an example, or they a a, a book author that they don't believe is, is, is sound. And they bring it to the attention of the pastor and the pastor thinks, oh no, here's another polemics report listener. You have to be a, a serving, loving, like giving, financially giving member of your biblical New Testament church. Clean the trash cans. Uh, do you clean trash cans? Take out the trash, clean the toilet, um, love grandma, shovel the snow, be there to turn the lights on, be, be there to put the coffee on, turn the lights out, pray for people, call them in the middle of the week, uh, serve your neighbor, love your neighbor, be an ideal church member. So they know that when you have a complaint or a concern or a discernment tip, you're not there just to be the, per, you know, the perennial critic. You're there because God has gifted to the church, the gift of discernment, and it's given by God, the Holy Spirit. And when you criticize someone or treat them as lesser than because they have a gift of God, the Holy Spirit, you're coming dangerously close to blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. So don't do that. Embrace your fellow Christians who have the gift of discernment. We want to teach you to do it well. We've been doing discernment as a polemics ministry for a very, very long time, much longer than this podcast has existed. We want to teach you that stuff, but it's not for your benefit. Just like the spiritual gift of mercy is not for your benefit. The spiritual gift of giving is not for your benefit. The spiritual gift of administration is not for your benefit. The spiritual gift of teaching is not for your benefit. It's for the benefit of others. So you need to belong to a biblical New Testament church. If you don't know how to find one, send me an email, jd at pulpitandpen.org. And in a week or two or three, I'll get back to you eventually. Um, I'll answer your email about how you, you know, with some with some directories that you can search for, and it may involve uh, quite a drive, uh, depending upon where you live, but it's always worth it. I promise. Um, let's get to the good news, though. The program, the good news that I always want to share, because Paul says it is of first importance, is that um, Jesus, God, the the Son, the second person of the Holy Trinity, came to Earth to die for people who don't deserve it. And when I say people who don't deserve it, what I mean by that is is literally uh, everyone, but 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 including you, um, assuming that you would believe in him. And so he died for sinners who don't deserve it, who are those who he has chosen to give faith. 
And in order to be justified, you must be justified by faith and faith alone, by God's grace alone. And what you must have faith in is an object, and that object needs to be Jesus. Now, there is a heresy out there, speaking of polemics and pointing out bad theology, called word faith theology that deifies faith itself. It says faith itself has power. No, it doesn't. Faith has to have an object. The object has to be Jesus. And not Jesus down at the local tire shop, but the real Jesus of the Bible, the one who was conceived of the Holy Ghost, born of a virgin, the one who lived a perfect life on your behalf vicariously and then died vicariously on your behalf. Here's how that worked. God took all the sins of every person who would believe in him, placed them on his son. Then he took out his wrath on your sin on the back of Christ instead of of upon you. You could never pay the debt and you could never survive that. But God the Son, because he has deified God incarnate, he laid his life down and then he picked it back up again. He proved that his deity was real because he just picked his life back up after having been dead and buried in the grave for three days, um, proving that his sacrifice was accepted and good enough. He died for sinners, and he rose again from the dead, and therefore we also will raise again from the dead because we are in Christ. One day he is returning to take his children home and also to settle some scores. We look forward that to, to, to that too. If you believe what I just said, which might sound like total weird poppycock weirdness, um, if you believe that, that's because God gave you faith. And then, therefore, you should be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, again, in a biblical New Testament church. That said, um, uh, David Morrill joins me from Denver, Colorado. And uh, we appreciate David. He does the tech end of this stuff. We appreciate David. Uh, what are we going to talk about in today's program, David? Or you don't have to give us the download. We can just get into the topics and people can figure it out. By the way, I should should have added, this program is entirely supported by our patrons who give $5.95 a month to get the full program. So you might be a freeloader who gets it for free. That's awesome. That's why the gospel comes at the beginning of the program, because the gospel is free. But we pay writers at like Protestia. We, uh, we get involved, I, like right now I'm putting together a radio station that I'm kind of panicky over that because it should be done any day now. And we're going to have the best programming in the nation. I talked to Paul Washer and I got permission from John MacArthur to play their sermons on Sunday afternoons from 3 to 5 p.m. We're putting together the best programming we can. Uh, it's going to be the best radio station in the United States, I think, but obviously I'm partial. Um, that's what you help us do. So for five ninety five a month, you get access to the full program. You get subscribed to the Insurgency News Blast once a day, put together by the Gideon Knox the Gideon Knox News Team. They will find you the best likely to be banned news and send it directly to your email inbox. For nineteen ninety five a month, you can join us at the Bulldogmatic Bible Study. For thirty four ninety five a month, you get something from the Reform Gear Store. For forty nine ninety five a month, you get books sent to you from. Uh, uh, well, from me, from me, but from different sources. Um, this month, it's the gospel worthy of all uh, acceptation by uh, Andrew Fuller and a book to teach children that uh, trannyism doesn't exist. And so there's that. Um, uh, you get books for that. Uh, yeah, that's how that's how we stay financially uh, solvent. I met a senator. Uh, shook his hand the other day and he said, what's your business model? How do you stay like still doing this all the time? And I, I, I said, uh, people believe in what, what we do. And that surprised him, but people believe in what it is that we do. Um, which is tell the truth. Mostly David, um, you got your, uh, sorry, you checking your my text. <laughs> I don't have my original audio on again. If you're listening to this program for audio quality, now it's on. Oh, sweet. Um, you, uh, you, if you listen to it for audio quality, wrong... you just heard a change. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're listening to the wrong program. If you want audio quality, we're, we're trying to fix all that. Um, but, uh, it's pretty good now. It's it, it, great. Yeah. Great. 
just imagine the gospel, but in better audio quality. Problem solved. <laughs> David, what are we talking about tonight besides uh, the Colorado Rockies or whatever your hat represents? Yeah, well, I, I told you I had some, I'm, I'm getting some Mile High Evening News hats uh, embroidered, so I'll have my you know a different logo mm. on not that i mind the rockies the rockies are you know i mean they're not very good this season but you know it is what it is still root for the home team are you allowed to say that as first of all are you allowed to say that as a rockies fan secondly are you contractually obligated to be a rockies fan because <laughs> you live no in denver nope i'm a actually a cubs fan and when people around colorado ask well what why are you a cubs fan and not a rockies fan i say you know baseball existed Wish before 1993 <laughs> Oh. Well, so I'm from Missouri where everybody is a St. Louis Cardinals fan, and I don't know anything about sports other than I that hate the I'm, Cardinals. Supposed to, I'm supposed to hate Cub, the Cubs. Right. <laughs> so apparently they have some kind of feud. I don't know. Yep. It's, never, it's a I, long, I, I, I long got, existing feud. All right. Well, it's a good thing I don't care about sports. Yep. Although I guess Frank Mullis' daughter is apparently the new... Uh, who's who's, who's the, we, We've had this discussion recently. The MMA... There, Give me the name of a female MMA fighter. Oh, like Ronda Rousey or? Yeah, you know. she's, I guess, Frank Mullis of the Bible Thumping Wingnut. Formerly, I think they quit doing their podcast, Grappling with Theology, his daughter, did her first MMA fight the other day. And one-handedly, uh, I think, uh, had a uh, knockout, um, which uh, not quite sure I agree with the, the whole thing. But... Uh, we love Frank Mullis, and we love his daughter, so it shows some work ethic, I guess. Pursuit and of happiness. Also, <laughs> um, pursuit of happiness, and also, um, I'm betting she can beat up uh, some boys in her class. So, you know, might keep the boys away if, if your daughter's a cage <laughs> fighter. I don't know. There's that. Good for Frank Mullis, and shout out to his daughter. Don't know her name. Although they call her the gentle savage, I hear. Um other than that, this is still some pointless <laughs> conversation. What are we talking about in today's program? So we're going to start with Doug Wilson uh, posting an article on his blog entitled, I think he called it a biblical defense of fake vaccines. We we put it up at Protestia and, and linked to his piece. Fake vaccine passport. Oh, yeah. It, yeah. A biblical defense of fake vaccine IDs is what he called it. So okay, we, so we're gonna we're gonna the, discuss that. We're going we are going to discuss that because a lot of people are wondering: Am is it okay that I practice deception when it comes to vaccines? And I saw it at Pulpit and Pen, and then I saw that it was aggregated from Blog and May Blog, which didn't surprise me. But we posted. I did. I personally posted fake vaccine passport templates online just in case. So uh, we're going to go through the biblical defense for a fake vaccine passport or a fake vaccine or deception to avoid having your bodily autonomy um, uh, ruined by tyrants. And uh, let's go ahead and get into that. But we have other topics. We'll let, 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 let the listeners know what's coming. There's that. There's what else? We have a then, few questions from our patrons. Yeah, we'll, and we'll get to that in the patron portion. I'd like to talk about this latest survey um, published by the Christian Post talking about 60% of adults under 40 saying Jesus isn't the only way to salvation, equal to Buddha and Muhammad, and these are self-described born-again Christians. Can so, we talk about Jen Den Hollander um, being pimped out by her husband as a professional victim and that abusing a sexual victim for the sake of political um, scoring political points is actually abusing sex victims a second time, and that she is raping the evangelical church, and that she is comparable to Larry Nasser in that respect, or is that going too far? No, I think I think I think that's all right. Are we talking? We're talking about Rachel um, Den Hollander. Did I say Jen Den Hollander? Rachel right. Den Hollander is the Larry Nasser. I don't know if we'll get to that part. It, I might leave that behind the paywall. Um, I meant to have something written up by this point, but it's been a busy week. So if you're listening to the program, um, you know that I'm involved in some lawsuits. And now one of the Native American trannies that are suing me has uh, acquired a new uh, attorney um, who happened to 
have been Governor Bullock's chief legal counsel and apparently is some kind of shark attorney who ran for attorney general and lost by 16 points. So now God, in his graciousness, is going to let me put his head on a mantle. So uh, he, because he's joined her lawsuit, he is now representing her. So it's J.D. Hall and my attorney, Matthew Monfortin, against two women who served as clerks for the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, a transgender, quote unquote, man from the Northern Cheyenne tribe who thinks he has two spirits. He doesn't. He has one, and it's male. And uh, Raph Graybill. Raph Graybill, by the way, is in the news because he just this week filed a lawsuit, four lawsuits, in fact, against the state of Montana fighting on behalf of Planned Parenthood. So he is suing Planned Parenthood and J.D. Hall. I could not be in better company. So uh, bring it on. That's the public posture that I'm giving the world. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, bring it on. So I assume that, uh, you know, the, 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 the advice that I got, David, when I first started hunting was, because I, I took the first deer that came along, the first buck. I felt bad because I'm like, I could have waited for a bigger buck. And the guy I was with, his name was Neil Slosher. He's like, no, 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 don't do that. Don't, don't feel bad because you took a little spike buck. Um, it wasn't a spike buck, a fork buck. It was a four, little two by two buck. But just, just have a roll in your head. Always take a deer that's a little bit bigger than the year before. That should be your goal. So I've done that for 15 years. I just, I want to. So God in his graciousness was not satisfied with me beating in court a sad, pathetic, transgender man. He wanted me to be in court the baddest Democrat lawyer in Montana. So praise God that he has given um, uh, an opponent more worthy uh, to uh, the army of God and a better trophy to bring home to put on my wall. I would make a scalping analogy, but with the Northern Cheyenne thing, that that would be taken the wrong way. So um, there's that. Pray for that. Um, also, it's a little bit of a problem that we raised uh, $10,000 uh, for that lawsuit. And I won't mention the name of the company yet, but they don't seem to want to give it to us because apparently uh, of hate speech, because when you call a man a man, uh, it's hateful, I guess. Um, so we'll have to figure that out. If you gave money for that and find it given back to you by that company who you donated to, then you'll, you'll just get an email from my secretary saying, please send a check, a paper check, cash, money order. And then they'll actually have to come physically and retrieve that from my church in order to steal that from me. Which they won't because uh, we'll, we'll. It seems like a really just, good use for cryptocurrency. <laughs> it does seem like a good use for cryptocurrency, although we, that can be a different conversation. I, I hear that some crypto is not that safe and it's quite trackable and it's not as good as what some different cryptos have different. Uh, what's the right word? Functionalities. They're not all equal, right, David? Mm hmm. Yeah, well, it's, I mean, it's, so it's I still, dabble, all... I dabble in, in crypto, but I'm not an expert. Anyways, yeah, what are we talking about? <laughs> so, so we're going to talk about the biblical. Defense. I think, I don't think we're going to fund this thing in Bitcoin. It may have to, it may have to be a paper check. So if you gave, <laughs> if, if you notice that money go back into your account, it's the banks who are stopping us from defending ourselves against uh, the right to call a man, a man. Go ahead, David. Well, I, I think I told you in a in a chat conversation or something that this is it's fundamental for the bank to to say we're going to stop you from transacting this this money based off of religious expression is I would argue is a, is the exact same violation of the 1964 Civil Rights Act as what Town Pump did by saying you can't express your religion and your freedom of speech within our establishment. We'll you know we'll deny you service. It's the same right thing. and. In that case, I'm going after them, but I'm much, and they will also have some high-powered attorneys because I mean they're, I mean they're billionaires. 
Um, but I'm so confident that it's a civil rights violation. I'm not really worried about their attorneys. Not that I'm worried about Gray Bill either, for that matter. But there, these are, I wanted to retire. That was my goal by the age of 40. I don't, it seems like there's just fight upon fight that is being compiled. That was two months uh, ago, I, wasn't it? Well, yeah. <laughs> I guess, you know. Some people would look at that and say, you got yourself into that. David, have you ever been in a situation where it's almost like it's not you talking, but it's, it's, I, I don't, yes. don't get me the wrong way. It's, I'm not saying it's the Holy Ghost and it's divine direct revelation, but where it is coming out of your mouth, whether you like it or not. Yep. More, more so, than I'm comfortable with, but it's actually, it's actually a blessing in the end usually. That happens to me pretty frequently. By that, I mean a couple times a year. Maybe more than that. Maybe it's once a month or something. But it's like, I'm saying this, but it's not me saying this. I'm not trying to, ca- I'm not trying to blame the Lord. But when I, like at Town Pump, I see the transsexual. I ask what the pen means. He says it stands for transgender pride. And I'm like, in my head, don't, don't say anything. Don't say anything. But at the same time, my mouth comes out with, well, you're not a man you're, or you're not a woman. You're a man. You should repent and trust in Christ. That's, 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 I'm, I don't want to blame God for picking that fight, but that wasn't me. I, that, it really wasn't me that said that. That was Christ who lives in me who said that. So um, I'm sure that's not a legal defense. I don't well, want to call that direct divine revelation, but it was it was a witness that was within me. I mean, let me take it back about Jesus. I don't want to say that was Jesus that said that. That was the that was. But the Spirit leads us to to say things that are true for sure. You know, was it? I I think I think you said this. I I, this I, I felt as though I had no choice, and it was against my will. The 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 truth is always loving, and falsehood is always hateful. Wasn't it? You told me that, or something like that. Oh, I've said it many times. Yes. Yeah. Truth is always loving. So yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna Ed Litton that from you and start using that as my own words. If Go that's right cool. ahead. Go right ahead. <laughs> oh no, no, you're not allowed think, to give me permission. I don't think, I don't think Ed, Ed Litton has there well, we went through the article recently where the guy says there's no such thing as sermon plagiarism, so just steal whatever you want, I guess. <laughs> there is no eighth commandment, according to uh, what's his face. But we've been there, we've done that. So let's talk about vaccine passports. So um, the question is, is it reasonable, is it acceptable for a Christian to forge a document that says that they have a vaccine when in fact they do not have a vaccine? So David, give us the debrief on what Doug Wilson thinks. And by the way, I always make a caveat with Doug Wilson because if I don't, I get hate mail. Um, Federal Vision is awful. He has not repented of that to the extent that we would like him too. We think that to some degree he's playing semantics. That's that's the that's the scenario that a lot of people assume. He's playing semantics when it comes to Federal Vision. Has not fully repented of that. Um, he th- he he thinks that Roman Catholics are Christians, which is a problem. Although that they'll go to hell, which is a part of the federal. It's a part of his Federal Vision weirdism. And uh, he calls himself a theonomist, and I really wish he wouldn't use that word. Other than that, I think he's a brilliant, if not the best, Christian writer um, around. Blogger, at least, period. Like, he would beat Chally's seven days a week. He's good. Give us the down low of the article, David. Well, and I, I can't tell you that I necessarily got everything in here because I just perused over it before we start. I mean, obviously, you and I would have our own views of this and our own arguments to make. But I think that Doug Wilson made a pretty good argument here and lined it up in a pretty a pretty good way as far as establishing the differences between <clears throat> government authority and what they're actually doing to us, doing to free men and women by trying to vaccinate us against our will. And I mean, he basically lays out and he lists seven principles regarding fake IDs 
and starts with, you know, if you are in a position to resist openly, do that. And that's what we, that's what we're doing now is we get on to the podcast or we right. get on the internet and we say, we're right. not taking this vaccine. So l- let me give that's an what example. We start with, right? Let me give an example of that one. Well, let, let's try to get through these seven if possible. So I'll talk quick. My, my son uh, was uh, involved in, uh, well, my son works at McDonald's and they make him wear a mask. I uh, can't do anything about that. And it's not the end of the world. It's not the vaccine. I care a lot more about the vaccine than I do a mask. Mask is a significantly smaller deal to me than a vaccine. Plus, he's not 15. I'm not really, I, I don't care about his bodily autonomy as much as I care about mine. I guess I'm selfish. But they had a rule for a while that if you weren't vaccinated, you had to wear a mask. And if you were vaccinated, then you didn't have to wear a mask. But... I called the legislator who wrote HB 702, who pointed out that that's discrimination, which has been made illegal in Montana. So I went to the manager of my son's boss and very politely explained that the policy you had in place two weeks ago, or whenever it was, was in violation of Montana law, and that they cannot discriminate against their employees for not having a vaccine. We're the only state in the union where that's the case. But... Uh, I could resist openly there with a conversation over, about the law, uh, and I could resist uh, as a free man. And thankfully, the law was on my side. There are some places where the law is not on your side, but you're not going to get locked up. Um, so resist openly where you can resist openly. Fair enough. You don't don't go straight to deceit. Right. As a general rule. Okay. Yeah. What's I mean, number two? And, and especially around here, when we start at a basis of being free men and women, we use those rights first. We use those speech rights first. We 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 protest, we write to the legislator, we we do everything we can do right. before we start right. lying. Right. We would well, it, it's like the, the the Bill of Rights. We would much rather use the freedom to petition our government for grievances before we take our AR 15s down to the courthouse and take it over. All right. So the Whitefish uh, Credit Union is a story that we're working on at the Montana Daily Gazette. In our opinion, they've stolen a bunch of people's property, including a giant mountain in Kalispell. The sheriff called uh, the co-host, uh, or rather the host of Montana Gazette Radio today over in Kalispell, because I've got an office on that side of the state. And he called and he said, Jim, please tell me that it's not true that you're going to take the mountain by force. And Jim's response, I'm paraphrasing, was that's not necessarily accurate. That's only plan B. The plan A is that you first take it by force. Because we were ready to call in the Montana militia and we will take the mountain by force if we have to. It was stolen property. It was our property, not not mine, but it's this man's property. If he wants it back, he'll take it back. Um, but Jim's point to the sheriff was it's actually your job to investigate crimes like theft. So they made a deal and the deal was the sheriff's department would investigate the bank for theft and then we'll go to the second amendment if we have to. And that was the deal that they struck. That's how the law ought to work. So we handle the first amendment. If that fails, we've got the fallback, which is the second in the similar way we have, I mean, we would prefer to be honest and open, but if we're operating under the rules of war, and certainly this is chemical warfare against the world, against humanity, these are war crimes being committed against human beings. Uh, If you demand that I be a part of your Tuskegee experiment, then we will go to deceit in the same type of ways that we've seen deceit uh, in the Holy Scripture. And and this is is directly related to conversations, general conversations within the larger church world about Romans 13 and the idea of submitting to the government. Uh, Wilson, I think Doug, Doug Wilson argues here. I think we would, we would both argue that in this kind of a situation, the government has broken its basically covenant relate. The civil magistrate has broken its covenant relationship with us and is, is now acting evil and is take is, is moving that direction that's that if, we don't submit to them and just go along with it. If you believe in the social compact theory of government 
and that the founding of the American government was just, then you must believe that resisting COVID passports is just because the American government has ceded its right. It has walked away from the contract, the compact it made with the American people in the U.S. Constitution. And as it says in the Declaration of Independence, there, uh, in the course of human events, there comes a time for the ties. How does it phrase it? Uh, the t- well, Mojo Nixon, the great philosopher, would say, there comes a time for the ties to get busted up. There comes a time in the course of human events for the ties that bind to be broken. Sorry, that's the best I can come up with at 8.58 at night. It's been a long day. Um, they've, they, they have broken their, their compact with us, which, by the way, comes from John Locke, who was a Reformed theologian. But if you're one of those guys like Todd Friel who says that you should submit to the government. That's really what we should be talking about tonight, David. Well, we're going right into it right now. (laughs) Okay. We should be talking about Todd Friel, who said that we should submit to the government even if the government wants us to wear pinwheels on our head. If your idea of government is just submit to anyone that says that they have charge over you, then um, you have no... Obviously, you're pro-slavery, okay? You're a pro-slavery guy. But for those of us who are not born slaves, Todd Friel is a friend of mine. I texted him the other day. I said, give me five minutes of your time to save you a big headache. And, and he eventually texted me back and said something like, hey, I love you, JD. I know you're just trying to help. But he wouldn't give me five minutes of his time. So he's going to get a bit of a headache. He apparently was born a slave where anyone, including a drunk man, claiming to be the government, could say, do this, and he would do it. Simon says, wear a pinwheel, and he'd wear a pinwheel. So you actually miscited the scripture, David. You said, submit to the government, Romans 13. It says, submit to the governing authorities, Mm -hmm. and that word authorities means ekousia. Ekousia means jurisdiction, and we should submit to the rightful jurisdiction. There is no jurisdiction that the government has over my body or over my person or over my home. All right? They don't and, have that. And beyond it's that, God's for, ju- it's be- God's jurisdiction over my body and it's and I am I am its steward and it's my jurisdiction over the home. And and beyond that, the citizenry has jurisdiction over the operation of the government as well. We're, we're a nation in America, at least. I mean, I could, I, we could may not be able to make this argument about, about every country on the planet, but in America, we're, we we're, we're ruled by laws, laws that we have to sign off on the, the citizen is above any, but any government official, as far as this goes, I, all of us being I've under been, the law. I've been flying a lot lately and this, I won't blame on God. This is all me. And I want to say it. It's not like I'm forced to. But when you hear them in the airport say, according to federal law, you have to wear a mask, I shout out, that's a lie. That's not a law. That's not a law. All right. Laws are passed by legislators. Laws are not decreed. So I don't, I, I shout it out not to be a jerk, but to point out, I guess, I don't, I don't, I, to point out, laws are not decrees. Laws, go, like, you know, the automobile, you know, the like the, the Schoolhouse Rock uh, theme song? Mm-hmm. Uh, laws are passed through legislatures, signed by legislators, then signed by, gov- by governors or by presidents, and then not overruled or vetoed by Congress or the State House. That's how... It works. So when an unelected health department decrees something and they're not held accountable by the people, it has exactly zero authority over me. Zero. Either, and and by the way, some laws are issued and decreed by people who were voted for, but it doesn't mean they have the jurisdiction to make the ruling. Or in the case of much of the United States, unelected health boards who were not elected to office, not chosen by the people, have been made despots by declarations of the governor 
to rule the lives of the people and to rule over our bodies, at which point we say, you are exceeding the power given to you by the compact of government, and we hereby declare the compact over. Done. And now we're operating under the auspices of war, which in the Bible ex excuses deceit, a righteous deceit. Right. I may be way off track from what Doug Wilson was saying. I'm not sure. It's, no, it, it, it's pretty darn close. And I think that for Americans, at least, we also have to consider that even if they're elected officials, even if we elected them, anything that they do, any law that they pass still has to fall under the principles of the Constitution. It has to be constitutional. So when you say, I got to put a piece of fabric over my face or I have to, you know, distance from people, not go to church, all of these kind of things, very clearly that's unconstitutional. So in our system, you're not allowed to pass laws or write write things into law that go counter to the supreme law of the land, which is the constitution. You know, and and fortunately, we, we've been I, gifted I, I with this document. Up. You know, we've been gifted with a document that is very if you if you understand it properly, is very biblical in nature. I'm ashamed that I had to look it up, but it's the unit when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary. I had to memorize this to pass eighth grade and I've forgotten it. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands, which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth, the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them a decent and respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the cause which compels them to the separation. In this case, the cause which requires us to the separation is, you have no legal authority over or jurisdiction over my body to tell me what to wear, or to tell me how to cover my face, or to tell me how to best medically protect myself. You have none. None. And what we're talking about, and in terms of Todd Friel, he did a segment where he said you should wear pinwheels on your head or that he would if the government said to wear pinwheels because that's the government the government says to. And I'm frustrated with Todd because he ap appears to make no effort whatsoever to do the, even the most basic exegesis on 1 Peter 2 or Romans 13. He takes a position that is against John MacArthur. And I consider it strange that Phil Johnson serves on Todd's board and would let him get away with that. And Rush Dooney said, by nature, some people are slaves. That appears to be Todd Friel. But the guy who wrote or produced hermeneutics, uh, or Herman Who, the hermeneutics study, you know, study tool, for him to be incapable of even the basic exegesis on Romans 13 is frustrating. Yeah, well, and he said before that segment, I think he said something, and I'm trying to remember, I think he said something along the lines of, I may get this totally wrong and totally screw this up. And then he did <laughs> like he set himself you know, up, I guess. I don't know. I have an email. You keep talking. I have an email from, uh, John Harris about this. John Harris did a video. Let me see what John said. There've been several, because it's been several days, uh, since this came, since Todd started talking about this and several, um, pretty popular, uh, I think A.D. Robles has talked about it now. I'm sure John has talked about it a little bit. We're, I guess we're a little bit late to the party perhaps, but the, but the, the, the important thing to understand, I, I would argue the important thing to understand is that if you, if you look at what the Bible says about what, and, and what the Bible teaches about uh, individual, you know, we call it Baptist, we call it soul competency, right? The idea that every individual is, is capable and responsible directly to Christ made in the image of God that those core ideas I guess form the juris you know the the jurisprudence of the United States of America it's what our founding documents are kind of based around we can uh, we can guess, actually go to those with rely you know reliably John Harris did a video that I think I asked him about and he's I haven't seen it yet that I, I don't think he named Friel and I'm not I'm not at privy to share communications but Friel did reach out to Harris and offer to talk about it. Hopefully Harris can talk some sense into Todd. That would be great. This um, isn't I mean, the first, this isn't the first time that, I, I, that Todd's been kind of on this topic and on kind of in the middle of it and, and interpreting it wrongly. Well, I time. texted, I texted Todd, like I said, and said, give me five minutes and let me try to avoid you a headache here. I'm trying to help you. 
And he said, you know, thanks for your help and I appreciate your concerns. And my text back to him was, you don't know what my concerns are because I haven't told you. And then he never texted me back after that. Do you think he knew what they were? I, I think, <laughs> yeah, I, think he, yeah. I think he, I think he knew what my concerns were because the only other time I've ever busted Todd's shops is over Romans 13. So he probably figured, but I'm like, I, I'm not really sure that you do appreciate my concerns because you don't know what my concerns are. But what is making some people I'm sure upset at the moment is you're talking about placing the constitution above the Bible. You're talking, you're talking about the declaration of independence and the constitution and John Locke's social compact theory of government. But Roman 13 says what Roman 13 says. Um, <laughs> We, well, we don't have an emperor, so this takes biblical application to determine who who are we supposed to obey? Who Who is that? Or what is that in our form of government? So, it, for example, if you have a local government contradict a state government, that is contradicting the federal government, then who do you obey? Who do you obey? And by the way, I asked Montana Gazette radio host, um, Jim White, James White, it's kind of funny, that's his name, uh, to have Matt Trey, how do you say his name, Trahala on again? He was on a few weeks ago. I missed him by a few minutes. To discuss it because I, I, I heard that Frill took some shots at the doctrine of the lesser magistrate as well. So if I could explain that real quick, the doctrine of the lesser magistrate basically says every elected official who takes an oath has a responsibility to keep that oath to the people first and foremost who elected them. So where this would come into play is in the state of Kentucky, the state constitution says that gays can't be married. Kim Davis was a county clerk in Kentucky. Lesbians or queers of some kind came and asked for a marriage license. Kim, am I getting her name right? Is it Kim Davis? Sounds Kim familiar. Davis. Kim Davis said, no. I took an oath to uphold the Constitution of the state of Kentucky. The state of Kentucky, the Constitution has not been changed by an order of the Supreme Court. Neither has the Constitution of the United States changed. Because I believe that you would take, I think you take an oath of office, office to both the United States Constitution and the state Constitution. Neither one has been changed by an order of the Supreme Court. The law has not changed. I was elected by the people of this county. Google it real quick, David, so I don't get it wrong. Kim Davis, Kentucky. I was elected by the people of this county, I have an oath that I took literally before God, so I am not going to marry these, I'm not going to hand out a marriage license to this gay couple. And they ended up throwing her in jail. That's the doctrine of the lesser magistrate, where we would say, if you take an oath, your first priority is to the people that elected you. This comes very important when it comes to the county sheriff. The county sheriff should have said, I took an oath to uphold the, the Constitution of the United States of America. What jail are you going to put Kim Davis in? That's what the, that's what the sheriff should have said. Because you're not putting her in my jail. You're going to have to take her to Guantanamo or somewhere. And I'm not arresting her. You're going to have to do that. Because I took an oath to uphold the Constitution, and I'm held accountable, first and foremost, to the people who elected me. The opposition, or the other side of the doctrine of the, like, like the non-lesser magistrate view, says you must uphold, you must adhere to the doctrine of the greater magistrate, meaning if the governor tells Kim Davis, uh, in this case, I think it was the lieutenant governor, tells, uh, or the attorney general, told Kim Davis, issue the marriage license. She has to, because he's her boss. Here's the thing. She didn't take an oath to him. She took an oath before God to the people of the county. Right? What what county did you, what was that? When was that, David? That, so that would have been 2015. 
2015. Yeah, was... So they locked up a law-abiding woman who did nothing but affirm her oath of office. So without the doctrine of the lesser magistrate, you have, and I know the first one to mention Hitler loses, you have the Holocaust. So if you're a United States soldier and you take an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States of America, that is your first and foremost obligation. So if you are given an order that you know, not, 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 not that you think, but that you know is unconstitutional, you have an obligation to God to disobey that order. That's the doctrine of the lesser magistrate. Now, David, if you got to cut this out, cut this out. You're in the service. I don't want to bring the law down on you or martial law down on you. Well, I don't want I, to bring military law if down I, if on I you. If I correctly describe it and correctly uh, defend you know, what it's supposed to be, I have what no fear of getting take, in trouble. <laughs> what, what oath did you take? The Constitution of the United States. It, it, so military members, like a, a soldier, would uh, you would swear to uphold and defend the Constitution, and then you would also swear to obey lawful orders, and it, that's part of it, lawful orders – um, that are given by your superiors. And that really is at the crux of it because tell me, what, makes, tell some, me if what this, makes an order lawful. Tell me if this is what it is. I do solemn with your name, do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and that I will obey the orders of the president of the United States and the orders of the officers appointed over me according to the regulations and the uniform code of military justice. So help me God. Yeah, that's, that's the that's, one. Okay. If there was someone who took control, let's say there's a coup d'etat of the United States president presidency. Who do you have to obey? That would create a dilemma that you have to figure out. It's not as easy as putting pinwheels on your head. Yep. You have to figure it out. Now, let me, it, it's going to get tricky here for a second. Was the election of Joe Biden a coup d'etat? No. On Donald Trump? No. No. Um, if it were a coup d'etat, like a military coup, let's say instead of enforcing D.C. with the National Guard and fences, they actually went in, removed the president without an election. Who would you defend, David? The man who said he was president or the man who was? It's the man who was. It's the man who was actually brought into that office via the law and by the procedures that are that are written in the constitution but, and underneath but it. what but what if the people above you who now control the pentagon tell you that you have to defend the usurper no you, you defend the constitution which could you know like you said could potentially put you in a very very uh dangerous bind yeah, people have had this problem That's, historically over well you know, thousands and thousands of years, right? <laughs> so if someone says, "David, you're in the National Guard, you need to go enforce," uh, here's my thought: if they start passing gun control laws that involve um, confiscation, they're going to have to use the National Guard because the county sheriffs will not cooperate with that. They're, they're not going to put their men in jeopardy. They'll bring in the guard. But I don't think they're going to bring in the local guard because we know where, they're li where they live. And I'll hang their dog from a tree. So we, I think, I think we, we would end up with like the Colorado Guard in Montana and the Montana Guard in North Carolina. I think that's probably how it would, how it would work. Or they might activate the military to do such a thing. I don't know. I'm just speaking hypothetically. But in that situation, someone who would truly be an oath keeper would say, unless, unless the Constitution has been changed, I'm not following this order. Right? I'm not right. following it. Sorry. I'm not doing it. 
without some that's that is the doctrine of the lesser magistrate right there i made an order and a, an oath i swore by god's name to uphold it i don't care who is over me i'm not following an order if it violates my oath that is the doctrine of the lesser magistrate period that in, in its simplest form so for Todd to be against the doctrine of the lesser magistrate is to stand with the Nazis who said, I was just following orders. Just following orders is not an excuse for violating the Constitution of the United States. And beyond that, it's, not a, an, it's not an excuse. Beyond, beyond that, it's a, it's a direct... Uh, it's going directly against our understanding, our biblical understanding of individual responsibility for righteousness before God. We don't we don't get to use he told right, me to do to, it as, as back an to the for sin, right? yeah, back, back to the theological yeah back back to the theological argument um, um, of of whose authority is is the body. It's God's authority with man as steward. If the government told you to murder a child, would you murder a child? I'd hope not. But when you, this is what frustrates me about the people who closed their church for COVID. When you cede the First Amendment right, which says the government shall make no law with respect to the free exercise of religion, and you say, well, except in a pandemic, you have opened Pandora's box and given them freedom to do it whenever they want. And they still are. So, so when John MacArthur or one of his guys asks, why does Gavin Newsom think he can tell churches to close? The answer is because you let them. That's why. And I always because argue, you let them. And I always argue that this actually may create in some situations, and I think it, it probably applies with certainly forced vaccination, but this creates a situation where I would argue that we have a moral obligation to say no, even if we think that we want to take the shot, we have a moral obligation to say no because it's being done under false authority, usurped authority. They've stolen this, this right for people to make this decision for themselves. I would argue we have an obligation to say no just on that principle because, like you said, once you open that door, now, now, once you open the door, if they can make us do stuff for safety reasons, there, there's no end to that. You can't logically put it. It's, put a stop it's to like it. when they say that they're not persecuting Christians because it's for health reasons. Do you right. think there's ever been a time of serious persecution that they didn't say that it was for the public good? Wake up. Read a book about the Holocaust. The final solution was for the public good, public safety, the public welfare, the public well-being. That's why this is a battle between collectivism and individualism. That's what it's about. Let's get to the next point from Doug. So his, his next point was, uh, if you, he says, if you are not in a position to resist openly, feel free before God to resist in this clandestine way. This will get you through your particular moment. It also has the effect of helping to make all the different kinds of, I like this, all the different kinds of vaccine IDs into a joke. <laughs> so basically a ton of fake ones on the market would create confusion and it, and it wouldn't work for anybody, which is fine with me. Fine with me. Yeah. Let's go to the next one. And third, le the legitimacy of using such IDs is not limited to gospel issues only. Don't assume that you could, um, only use such an idea if you were engaged in smuggling Bibles into Connecticut or New York. These are liberty issues. Any kind of lawful liberty is never a trifle. So basically what he's saying here is kind of what I was just saying, that the principle is the supreme. It's not, it's not because it's vaccines. It's not because it's masks or distancing or whatever. It's the principle of liberty that, that matters here. That's why this. It could and, be, it, you know, it could be the, the principle of the pinwheel as well. If they can make you do that, what else can they make you do? Mm -hmm. And I, I kind of like that Todd. To... I kind of like that Todd used a pinwheel example because you think about somebody putting pinwheels on their ears. What does it do? It humiliates them. It makes them look ridiculous. It depersons them. It it's, it tells that person right. you're right. a joke, and right. we're going to throw it right in your face that you, we have taken away right. your liberty. Right. 
So fourth which, point. Which, real quick. When we talk about taking away our liberty, I mean, there are some people who say Christians don't have rights. Sh- sh- that person is so stupid. Just don't even talk to that individual. Like their stupidity is going to rub off on you. The Ten Commandments, especially the second table, presupposes your rights. Okay, you got a right to you got a right to life. Six, the sixth commandment. You have a right to your wife. Seventh commandment. You have a right to your stuff. The eighth commandment. You have a right to your reputation. The ninth commandment. And you have a, you have a right to not have people, you know, plot and scheme to get your stuff, which is the tenth commandment. So the concept of rights comes from the ten the ten commandments. But the, the the frustrating part of the whole ordeal is if you give a mile, or rather if you give an inch, they'll take a mile. We are training the government to persecute and to kill us. You get no brownie points for submitting to a fake tyrant or a fake potentate. None. Yeah, that's it's interesting that you said that. I heard Candace Owens say that a couple of days ago. She said basically that we that the people of the United States especially are training the training the government to oppress us. And this this is something that I don't think Christians get very well. Professing Christians don't realize when they cite scripture that says that they need to be selfless and and giving and turn the other cheek in these things. Like you have the right in some cases to 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 you know certainly give away something that's rightfully yours generously. But when you do it in this case, when you actually, when you give away your rights and your authority over yourself, when you give away authority over your body to the government, you are also giving away other people's authority. You are giving away your, your fellow citizens' rights if you don't stand Absolutely. up for your own. You, know, but, you don't have the right to the give re- away my rights. You don't have the right to steal my rights and then give them away to somebody else, which is what you do when you give in up your In the state own. of Kentucky, where they went so hard after churches, I have to blame the churches that closed down. As much as I blame Governor Bashir for that, you told him that was acceptable by by bowing that knee to Baal. Mm-hmm. You're the one that trained him that it was acceptable. What's the next one from Doug? So yeah, he's so he says um, fourth the ethics of the thing are clear enough, meaning that you can be right with God and use a fake vaccine ID, but that doesn't mean you should risk going to a to federal penitentiary penitentiary in order to take your family to Disneyland. He's basically saying, be right. wise about right. it. Use it, use it only right. when you absolutely have to, not as right. a license to do other stuff, whatever you want. There should be a lot of things that you don't do with the fake vaccine passport. Right. Which of course uh, makes it. So you, you should reserve that to keep your gainful employment and so forth. Not, you know, to go do silly things like go to the movies or something. Right. So then Next. fifth, Fifth, he says, if you're a Christian elder or pastor and you can't see your way clear to do this kind of thing yourself, at least have the decency not to rat out Christians who do have that liberty in their conscience. Don't even think about requiring vaccine IDs in order to come to church. Do not dare to discipline one of your members who uses a fake ID in order to retain his ability to feed his family. Amen. Yeah. And You'd think that that would be clear, but we've seen what I mean. Churches come as soon as as soon as the FDA approved. I have ratted out vaccine. two church members. I have ratted out two church members in twenty two years, both for child molestation. A little different. <laughs> that, that, yeah, no, that's different. Like I'm pretty. I I could not imagine through being pastors in the world who would rat someone out for using a fake vaccine card. But I am sure that there are. Well, they would because they're requiring vaccines to come to church. Some of these church, I'm not putting them in scare quotes, these churches requiring vaccines and uh, presumably proving that was an that article of protest. Yeah. Wasn't, wasn't yeah. it? That was an article. And, and, and that was just the start of the, the start of the snowball rolling down the hill. There's going to be ton. There's going to be ton of churches that expose themselves. Can we not churches. find that video from Frill? Can we not find that and just go through that? Yeah, we might. We, I we, know we're, I know we're coming close to the patron. What, what number are we on for Doug? Yeah, this is uh he's almost done. So six, six, I like this one. Don't be a chump. Meaning you shouldn't have your cousin draw you a fake ID on the back of a napkin. If you're going to use a fake ID, don't settle for less. Use only genuine fake IDs. <laughs> Good advice. 
Yeah. But it is. <laughs> and number seven. Seventh, imagine yourself telling stories to your great grandchildren. Imagine that this nightmare period has passed and the true nature of the troubles has become obvious to all. Behave in such a way now as that you will not be ashamed to talk about it afterwards. If we win this thing, make sure you have some good stories. And just for the record, resigning from Hitler youth the moment it was safe to do so does not constitute a good story. You, which Jonathan, is what uh, Jonathan, Lehman and the Gospel Jonathan Coalition Lehman. did. Jonathan <laughs> Lehman, absolutely. Right. So, like, oh, it's um, all clear. It's all clear. Okay, <sighs> then we're good to open now. Church is essential. <laughs> Let's do a segment on the on Todd. Let's look at that video. Um, I said I'd take him to task, so I've got to. Whatever, however long this takes us, it takes us. Um, we may release this only to the patrons and only to Todd. I don't know. But we're going to take Todd Frill to task with the video. So let's find that. We'll put it on. And let me say a few things about Todd as, as you find it. I love Todd Frill. When I first, uh, the, the first thing that happened to me was I heard Shocking Youth Message, and it changed my understanding of God completely. And then I started listening to Wretched Radio, Fighting for the Faith, and The White Horse Inn. Like faithfully, every episode. And The Dividing Line. There's four podcasts all the time. I've met Todd. I know Todd. I don't want to say, say I know him well, but like my wife took his daughter horseback riding. I know him that well. Okay. So I think Todd, I think, hold on a second. You're, you're playing it. I, 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 I think Todd's my friend. Uh, I criticized Vody Bauckham once for saying he wouldn't name names. Thankfully, he went on to name names. And I've criticized MacArthur twice, both of time, both of which he has come around to my way of thinking. Thankful for that. Um, MacArthur said, I'm willing to fight heresy or false teaching, but I'm not willing to fight my friends. This is where I differ. I'm willing to fight my friends. Now, I'm not going to fight Todd or be dirty, uh, play dirty, play rough, but I'm going to explain why Todd is wrong theologically in this video. And so when you're ready to play it, David, play it. So this is a, this is a pretty long video. I mean, he's, this is a 44, 45 minute video. Mercy sakes. Is there not like a, uh, a shorter yeah, he's really got like a chapter here? Um, but da, 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 da. this is going to, this is going to buy me some editing time later. I think <laughs> we're, I'm going to jump in. We'll see if we can jump to the right place here. Okay. Which brings us to finally our objections. You may recall these were our pre understandings, the things that we had to set aside in light of all that we've learned. Let's work through them, shall we? This violates my constitutional rights. It violates Nuremberg, Geneva. That is correct. I, I would say this as an American, those issues are important. From a Christian processing, I'm not sure that they actually are a part of my theological pondering. I think it's a no-brainer as an American. Stop. Stop. David, can you do your best to repeat or paraphrase what Todd just said? Well, he seemed to say that. Either that or go back and play where he started, because I want to get it right. Yeah, let me run this just just a little bit. It sounds unbelievable. Let's work through them, shall we? Okay. This violates my constitutional rights. It violates Nuremberg, Geneva. Uh Yep. That is correct. I I would say this. Stop, 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 stop. Is he saying, in your opinion, David, that that's correct? That these mandates do violate Nuremberg, Geneva, and the Constitution? It seemed like it. But, but. Uh, that, That. He's about to get to the butt statement here, though. Okay. All right. Play I think. it. As an American, those issues are important. So those issues are important. Okay. Got it. As an American. From a Christian processing, I'm not sure that they actually are a part of my theological pondering. 
So, so he's just he's arguing that making a case for the Constitution or that it's illegal to do this under Nuremberg or Geneva is not part of his theological pondering as a Christian. I, I think I know what he's saying. Yeah, let's see if he, we'll go just a little further. I think, I, yeah, let's play. Yeah, let's I think it's a going. no-brainer as an American, isn't it? And and that annoys all of us. But theologically, I'm not sure where, where that plays in. I can't trump what the Bible says because of a constitutional right. The Bible's above the Constitution. The Bible is above everything. I do. I, I, I follow it. My body, my choice. Yeah, that's, no, that's stop, got... Stop there. Stop. He's going to a different topic. So the Bible is above the Constitution. David, do you agree with that? Do, do, do you agree with that? Yes. So I I don't know are they, who, are they in contradiction? What? Who is arguing the Constitution isn't above the Bible? That seems to me on the part of Todd Friel to be a gratuitous straw man. Straw man. No one is arguing that. What what we're arguing is we don't have an emperor or governors appointed by an emperor. Therefore, we have to figure out how to apply Romans 13 and 1 Peter 2 to the year 2021 in a democratic republic, in a government that is of the people, by the people, for the people, in which we don't take oaths to the governors or emperors, but the emperors, rather governors to be fair, instead take oaths to the Constitution. That there was a proposal at the Constitutional Convention to bring in the Constitution and to actually coronate it with a crown. Now, that suggestion was turned down as weird and wonky, but the idea was it is the law of the land. So the emperor in the first century was the law of the land. But now we don't have an emperor. So we have two choices. We can obey the first century emperor who's dead and dig up all of his edicts and follow them. Or we can submit to what is now our government. And the United States, by ratification, has submitted to Nuremberg and Geneva. By ratification of the United States Congress. And we have the United States Constitution that is our emperor. So my argument is, Todd Friel is actually not arguing for Romans 13. Todd Friel is arguing against Romans 13 for anarchy and for rebellion and for sinful insurrection against the rightful ruling ecousias or authorities or jurisdictions. That what Todd Friel is doing, piously, is arguing for sin rather than righteousness out of a stubborn refusal to apply the scripture and to divide God's word clearly. And, and go one layer further and tell me why he's doing this. I, I, Here's what I, I and, 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 heart and mine. Yeah, I don't and know. I, Do you have a guess? Exactly. I don't it's want to judge his heart, mine. but I I've certain, with, with a lot of, Christian. Actually, hold on a second. I do have a guess. Let me. I, I don't mean to interrupt you, David. Let me tell you. Let's, I, I'm curious to see if it's the same as yours. Todd Friel has consistently been wrong on every fact of COVID since the beginning. Todd Friel has consistently said from the beginning the same thing that Fauci has said, that we have from the beginning been found out over and over and over and over and over again is a lie. That what he has said has been statistical truth, has been not statistically accurate. And it is, it comes across, like uh, the because the, when you first ask, I don't know, but if I think about it for a second, it seems to me to be mo the most likely reason, a sinful stubbornness to admit that he was an heir all along. What were you going to say? I think that's part of it. I think that, and again, I, I, I don't think that we need to get in the category or in, into the, into the, business of trying to judge people's hearts particularly but what i what i see with a lot of christians and especially christians with public platforms who are in 
leadership positions who are looked up to, who are considered authorities on things doctrinally. And Todd is certainly in that group. I mean, like you said, a lot of us have, have very, um, we've benefited from his work. He's been a blessing to us. But here's the thing is when you have a public platform, when you're out there, when people know who you are, it takes that much more courage to look at somebody who's usurping authority. They don't have a government official uh, and uh, maybe another evangelical leader. So it takes a lot of courage to step up to them and say, no, you don't have that right. People in public positions take they, it, it's a bigger price for them, a bigger cost to stand up for the truth. And so it takes more courage. And sometimes that, that courage is really hard to come by so that they, they waffle and they, they try to find a middle ground and a ground where they can sort of please the, the more conservative among us, but also uh, still please the, the magistrate at the same. Is there a way that I can get down the middle of this, make everybody happy? If you, That's and we'll end, we'll end with this in the patron portion. Or, or the freeloader portion of the podcast. <laughs> if you refuse to do the work of exegesis on what the word ekousia means in Romans 13, you will not only end up enslaving yourself, but enslaving others. Do the hard work of exposition and know your scripture because one simple word can make a can make the difference between freedom and slavery. Todd Frill needs to do that hard work. Thank you for listening if you are not a patron. We'll talk to you next time, Lord willing, and the creek don't rise. If you are a patron, we're going to keep talking right after the music is over. Or this small, non-commercial break. We are the news source that will tell you the truth, no matter what. We are the ones who haunt the dreams of big tech gatekeepers who throttle free speech. We are the ones who have survived boycotts, blacklists, embargoes, and truth blockades. We are the ones who are still protesting. We are Protestia. Check us out online at protestia.com.